morning, we are, uh, I was going to wrap it up last week, but I felt impressed to do one more week on overcoming anxiety, because we have been dealing with this subject of overcoming fear, overcoming f- anxiety, and of course the scripture says in the last days, the days we're living in, that men's hearts would fail them for the fear of things coming upon the earth. Scripture tells us that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're always tempted on a daily basis to be in fear of things, aren't we? But yet Jesus himself declared that we're not to fear. Do not fear, do not be anxious about anything. Paul said, don't be anxious for anything, but in all things, by prayer, with supplication, or specifically request, make your, let your request be made known unto God. So this morning, let's turn over to Romans chapter 10, because uh, we just want to turn the corner a little bit this morning. And I want to share with you, because the last couple of weeks we've been... We've been dealing with the issue of standing against fear and overcoming fear. So how do we actually overcome fear? How do we resist fear so fear doesn't come into our lives and plague us? Because the Bible says in 1 John that fear has torment. Fear brings with it torment. When fear comes upon us and fear rises upon us, we are tormented. We don't have peace. You can't have peace and fear at the same time. I've said several times that when fear enters into our hearts or into a, an area, then faith leaves. And when faith comes, fear leaves. We can't walk in both at the same time. And if we're walking in fear, we're not going to be overcoming the world. We're going to be overcome by the world. And, of course, that's not what God has called us to. But in Romans chapter 10, we've been really emphasizing in the last couple of weeks about guarding what you're hearing. Be careful, Jesus said in Mark's gospel, the four chapters. Jesus said, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you hear. It's very important to be careful what you hear. And Romans chapter 10 tells us this in verse 13. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed the report? That's Isaiah chapter 53. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now next week, Lord willing, we're going to launch into a series on faith because I believe faith is a fundamental teaching, a fundamental belief of the believer, but it's something you have to hear over and over and over and over and over again because we slip. We fail to walk in faith. And again, we can be walking in faith one minute and believing God one minute, the next minute you turn around, a circumstance comes into your life and you're out of faith, you're in fear, you're in bondage. So we're going to talk about faith because every year that's one of the subjects I teach on at least once a year course we talk about faith a lot but every year at least once I like to do a series on faith and so we're going to do a series on faith and this is kind of leading up to that and of course this is part of that as well but it tells us here in Romans basically people can't believe to be saved unless they hear that Jesus is the Savior right if you've never heard about Jesus how can you believe in Jesus right well it's a fundamental truth we could apply this truth to anything How can we believe God for anything unless we hear that God is willing and able to do it? Right? You can't believe where you haven't heard. Just like you can't reap where you haven't sown. If you don't plant, you can't reap. If you haven't heard, you can't receive. Faith comes by hearing God's word, it tells us here in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing God's word. And a different word for faith would be trust, confidence, or assurance. Trust in God, confidence in God, or assurance in what God will do for us and willing, is willing to do for us comes from hearing God's word. So as we hear God's word, trust, assurance, and confidence comes in God's ability to do things in our life. Now, the flip side, as we've said before, is just as equally true. If we hear the false report, if we hear the evil report, we'll have confidence in the evil report. So this is why Jesus said... Be careful what you're hearing. Be careful what you're listening to. So if we're going to guard our hearts, the first and foremost thing we're going to have to be guarding against is what we're hearing. 
We have to guard what we're hearing. If you are standing in faith for finances, if you are standing in faith for healing, if you are standing in faith for anything in your life, then you're going to have to guard your heart against the negative words and negative thoughts that come into your mind that tell you you do not have the answer. If you don't guard against it, your faith is subject to being rooted out. As a matter of fact, let's turn in our Bibles over to the gospel according to Matthew because Jesus actually gave us an entire teaching on this principle in the parable of the sower. And in the gospel of Matthew, and of course this is also in Mark's gospel, the fourth chapter, but in Matthew chapter 13, I want to specifically look at this rendering of it because there's a passage in here that I want to uh, look at along this very line. And in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is teaching his disciples about the parable of the sower. And in verse 18, Jesus gives the parable, and he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away the, what, that which was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. And of course, the parable is, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus said, A sower went forth to sow. Some seed fell upon the wayside, never got in the ground. Some seed fell on the stony ground. Some seed fell among thorns, and some seed fell on good soil and brought forth a harvest, 30, 60, and 100. The seed that fell on the wayside is where people hear God's word because Jesus explains this, that, the king, that this parable, this truth, is how the entire kingdom of God operates upon the law of seed time and harvest. He said, actually, if you understand this truth, this parable, this teaching, you'll understand every, all the parables. You'll understand how the kingdom works because God's kingdom operates upon the law of seed time and harvest just like the planet operates upon the law of seed time and harvest. I mean, you, you see this principle throughout the word of God constantly. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever man sows or plants, the same he's going to reap. You can't plant seeds of ungodliness or seeds of unbelief and expect to reap a harvest of God. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. You can't plant unbelief and reap faith. You can't plant fear and reap faith or confidence, right? So we have to be careful what's being planted into the soil of our thought life, into the soil of our heart. And Jesus said, some seed, when the sower went forth to see, sow, which he said, the seed is the word of the kingdom. So when the sower went forth to sow, some seed fell by the wayside. It didn't get in the ground. And what does Jesus say here about this in verse 18? Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone, anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and what's the condition here? And does not understand it. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, immediately comes the wicked one and does what? He steals it. See, the only defense we have between, you know, the mercies of God, the weaponry of our warfare is, one of those weapons is, is the sword of the spirit, right? The other weaponry is the shield of faith. But if you think about all the weapons that Paul talked about in, in Ephesians chapter 6, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet shod with preparation of the gospel of, of peace. Amen? The shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. If you think about all those weaponry, they're all contingent upon the Word of God, aren't they? They all basically are the Word. You can't walk in any of them if you don't know the word. If you don't know that Jesus is your righteousness, how are you going to walk in righteousness? If you don't know that the gospel of peace that we just read about in Romans, how are you going to walk in that? If you don't have your mind renewed by the word of God, which the scriptures are full about renewing your mind, let the word of God dwell in you richly. If you don't know that, if you don't know the word of God, none of these things are going to work for you. It's the knowledge of the word that works it in our lives. So Jesus said, when anyone hears the good news of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, immediately cometh the wicked one and snatches away the word that's sown in his heart. Now, of course, the basic element of this teaching is salvation. 
But the principle is the same whether you're a Christian or non-Christian. If we're a Christian and we hear the Word of God and yet we don't grasp what the Word of God means, faith comes, but when you don't understand how it works in your life, you won't maintain faith. It just won't happen. The devil will deceive you. The devil will steal it out of your heart. This is why Jesus said, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you're hearing. Because the amount of thought and study you give to what you're hearing will be what you reap. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Oftentimes, God's people are very casual and careless with hearing God's word. But very attentive to hearing the words of the enemy. Let me say that again. Oftentimes, God's people are very careless and casual about hearing God's word, but they're very attentive to hearing the words of the enemy. Now, we looked at this in two weeks. We looked at the people, the children of Israel that came out of Egypt with Moses in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, where the 12 spies were sent in. Ten came back and gave an evil report of the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land, and the inhabitants we saw were great men of stature, and we were as grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in their sight. Which we know later on is a total lie. It wasn't the way it was. But if we look at that passage of Scripture in Numbers chapter 13, which we're not going to look up today, but if you read the entire context, these men were fully convinced that they were going to be destroyed by these giants that were in the land. Caleb stands up, the man of faith who trusted in the word of God, and he said, quiet, you know, we are well able to overcome this land for their defenses departed from them and God is with us. See, Caleb looked at God's promise because his mind was set on hearing God's promise where the other people were attentive to the lies of the enemy. Now, was the giants and were the circumstances they were facing real? There were real giants there, weren't there? There were really powerful people. There were fortified cities. So the people that gave the report about these things, they weren't making things up. This was real. But the problem was, is they were measuring their circumstances by what they saw and by their own strength and by fear, whereas Caleb was measuring the circumstances by what God said. Caleb recognized that, yes, in our own strength, we have no power to overcome these people. In our own ability, we can't do anything. Jesus himself said, without me, you can do nothing. You're hopeless and helpless without me. Amen? So the, the, the issue with faith is nothing to do with circumstances. We all are going to face things in our life on a consistent basis that are in our own ability, in our own strength, we have no power to change, no power to alter, and certainly no strength to overcome it in our own. Right? So the, 12, the 10 spies, they gave a report that they focused on that was to one extent, factual, right? But what was the problem with that report? It's just as I said, they had no confidence in God's ability. And the way they talked about their circumstances, instead of standing up to the children of Israel and said, well, listen, we saw great men there. We saw, we saw giants in the land. We saw fortified cities. What they should have done is what Caleb did and say, we saw this, but it doesn't matter what we saw. Because God is for us. And let's go take the land. That's what they should have said, right? But that's not what they said. Instead, they let their mouths fly open and all this unbelief come out of them. And what happened? They poisoned the faith of the people of God to the point that fear came into the camp. It spread like a wildfire and the camp was overrun with fear. And all their faith went out the window. Everything God had done in those 40 years of leading them through the wilderness suddenly flew out the window and they didn't remember a single thing. In a moment, God was whittled down to nothing, who, a God who couldn't do anything, a God who was against them instead of a God who was for them, a God who wouldn't keep his promise instead of the God who is faithful and true will not lie. In a moment, their faith was gone. Do you see how important it is to not to hear the wrong thing? Nothing's different in our lives. I and mean, we prayed for people with cancer this morning. I heard a report the other day that said 
that the World Health Organization estimates that cancer in the next 10 to 20 years is going to almost quadruple. Thousands upon thousands of people are estimated to get cancer. And there are a lot of reasons for that. There are, we're exposed to a lot of chemicals today that we used to never be exposed to. We're eating things that aren't even food. Our diets are terrible. The American diet is one of the most toxic diets on the planet. We're eating garbage that is in food that we have no business eating. You know, our body doesn't even know what to do with it. You know, it's like putting some kind of bizarre substance in your motor in your car and expecting it to run. Well, you know, you put enough of it in there long enough and it's going to clog the injectors up and that car is going to die. I mean, we use ethanol in the gas we drive and if you don't clean that ethanol out, eventually it'll clog your injectors and your car won't run. Plug them up and ruin them. Same thing's true with our bodies. If we're constantly putting chemicals in our bodies, which we are on a regular basis, I mean, you buy anything in a grocery store that has a box, what does it say? You don't bring it home and say nothing but pure food. <laughs> it's all modified garbage. Even the food that they harvest to put it in the food is modified trash, you know? And that's a big contributor to illness. And as much as we talk about the advancement in medical science, we are now looking at this generation of young people as the most unhealthy in American history. Predominantly because we are eating and exposed to things that God never intended us to be exposed to. And, of course, it's, it's challenging, isn't it, to eat right and eat a really healthy diet. I mean, even the food you buy, unless you raise all of your own food, even the food you buy, the nutrients in the food is basically there's hardly any nutrients in vegetables and stuff in the store because of the way, you know, things are raised nowadays. So we know that. So we don't deny there's problems in the world. But we're faced with things all the time. Can I change that? Well, I could go on a crusade and say, well, we're going to change. And, of course, we try to do that. We try to, you know, raise a garden. Try to buy, you know, food from a local farmer if you can. Know where your food comes from. You know that during World War II, when, we, when World War II ended, almost 80%, I think it was, of the food in America was raised locally because they started the whole Victory Garden campaign and people raised gardens most of the food was raised locally and people knew where it came from and it wasn't modified, it wasn't garbage. And that's all changed. We don't even know where our food comes from. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I love fish, but if I go in a grocery store and I say fish and it's made in China, I won't buy it anymore. Says it's garbage. You don't know what, you know, uh, one of my favorite fish is tilapia. Is it tilapia? Is that how you pronounce it? Tilapia. Well, some of the reports I've heard, they raise that in China with chickens above it, and the manure goes down, the fish eat the manure. Yum, you know? So that's some of the problems we have with foods that come from other countries. You don't know what they're sprayed with. They don't have the regulation we have in America. So the fact is, we're faced with things that are attacking our body on a regular basis. And why did I tell you all that? Because as we deal with life, we're going to face issues in our lives that reports are going to come. You know, when you go to a doctor, if a person goes to a doctor and they say cancer and put your name next to it, what is the tendency? Fear. Fear. And with the rational, the natural mind, because the Bible says the natural mind, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It says the natural mind or the unregenerate mind does not understand the things of God for their foolishness to them, nor can it receive them because they're spiritually discerned. So if we think on a natural low level, which is the level of sight and sound, which means to be carnally minded, because to be carnally minded has much more to do with just walking by sight than it does walking in, in sin. To be carnally minded is death. Well, what does that mean? It means our minds are set on this earth. We only are operating by what we see. Now, the children of Israel that went in to spy out the land, those ten spies that came back and gave an evil report, and the Bible tells us in Hebrews that God called it an evil report of unbelief. They weren't denying circumstances. They were giving a true report when it came to circumstances, right? There were giants in the land. But it's the way they spun it. So the point is, 
we don't deny circumstances. We don't deny there's sickness. We don't deny there's tragedy. We don't deny there's enemies. We don't deny any of these things. But we deny them the right to rule over us. Now, there are those in the camp, the one camp, they say, well, God has a providential. They view the providence of God as if God just controls everything. And we have no say in anything that comes upon us because everything that comes is somehow the will of God. So we're just to accept everything as if God's hand were in it. And I don't know why this is coming on my life. And I don't know why God permitted this into my life. And I don't know why I'm suffering with this. But in God's awesome providence, he must have a plan. And I should just learn to live with it. I'm sorry. I don't find that kind of belief in the, in the Bible. I don't think it's scriptural. Because if you believe that way and you live that way, where do you, where do you resist anything? Where do I have something come into my life and I say, I'm not accepting this. This can't be the will of God. This is destroying my life. What kind of hope is in that? Well, we have hope laid up for us in heaven, and thank you, Jesus, that even if I die or even my life might be miserable down here, I do have a hope laid up for me in heaven. And we do live with our hope, and our minds should be set upon heaven. And you know what? There is no defeat in the believer's life. Even if people die from sickness or disease, even if people die from tragedy, if they're a believer, even if people's lives are cut short, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, that we can rejoice even though they may have had their lives cut short by the standard of years. Their name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and they're with the Father. Isn't that good news? You know, and that's why if I do a funeral for somebody, and I may think in my mind, the back of my mind, I said, you know, this is not the best. They sh it should have been this way, I think. But I don't know what's in their heart, and I'm not their judge. And we stand before God individually, and we are not to judge one another. And I don't know what's going on with people. There are th areas of my life I've missed it many, many times. How about you? And we just rejoice, like Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what we need to be. We need to keep perspective of things. So what? You stumble and fall. So what? You have heartache. So what? You have trouble in this life. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Glory to God. But I'm talking about living a life of victory. I'm talking about living a life where God is for you. I'm talking about the power of God to overcome seemingly unsurmountable odds. Because that's God's best. Did you hear me, church? That's God's best. Now, we've heard this stuff for years and years and years. And the Bible says, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. And the word poor there means the poor in spirit, those who are humble before God. Jesus, or James talked about the rich versus the poor in his epistle, and he said, do you not know that those who are poor in this world's goods are rich in faith toward God? But let me list. See, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. We have brothers and sisters all over this planet in developing nations that are dirt poor financially. They don't have anything, nothing, compared to our standards. And yet, by faith, they are rich in faith toward God. Many of those brothers and sisters I envy compared to the lifestyle we have. We have the comforts of this age, but they have faith that is valuable. And they have joy. They're not burdened down with the cares of this world like Americans are oftentimes. Because they don't have anything to be burdened down about. You know, I don't have things to deal with. And that's what... Paul, by the Spirit of God, he said, he who is uh, in the Lord's service must not be entangled in the affairs of this world. I mean, don't you find at times in your life the biggest challenge is keeping yourself from being entangled in the affairs of this world? It's all this junk I'm dealing with all the time. You know, it's my house, it's this, it's blah, 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 blah. Who was it? It was uh, the famous architect. Is it Frank Lloyd Wright? Was that the guy from a... Wisconsin, the famous, he said, you know, when a man gets a house, he gets a taskmaster and a mistress all at once. And it sure is true. I can confess that home ownership isn't all it's cracked up to be. I mean, really, it's not. I don't know where we bought into this hogwash in America that owning a home is the greatest thing since peanut butter. And I thank God I got a home to live in. And, you know, it, it may be better than flushing, you know, if you have to rent. I've rented houses and stuff, but 
it's not a paradise. Spend an awful lot of time and a lot of money wasting time. To me, it's a headache. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, I think it's good we should own homes. I, I think owning personal property is good. But somehow the American dream has become an American nightmare to us. People are consumed with things. And it takes a lot of time. Well, this message isn't about that. But um, anyhow, so I didn't say go sell your homes and live in a pup tent either. Um, but the, f the fact of the matter is we have to learn how to guard our hearts against what we're hearing. Because if you go to the doctor or you face financial situations in your life, which we're all going to face and face, or any circumstance in your life, you have two choices. You have the choice to accept it and be ruled by it or to face it and say, no, I have a God that is greater than this. I have a God that is well able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can even ask or think according to his power that works in me. Now let me assure you of something. You must be well-versed in hearing the truth about God's power, God's provision, God's character, God's ability far before you face a circumstance. Right? Because if you're not walking in the Word and you're not walking in the truth, what's going to happen when you face the circumstances, you're going to be faced with sense. You're going you're to have your senses rule you. And you're going to be looking around, and you're going to be wondering, what am I going to do about this, right? You're going to be like those ten spies. The doctor says, I have cancer, and I'm going to die. Right? The circumstances say, I don't have any money, and I'm broke. Right? The bill collector cometh. This circumstance in my life says this, and it is. And you're going to start talking about your problems, right? Well, this is what the doctor said, and the doctor said this, and the doctor said this, and the doctor said this, and this is what the doctor said. And they say, I got to do this, and this, and this, and this, and this is the report. And your faith will just take wings and fly right out the window. And fear will come upon you, and darkness will come upon you. I remember Brother Hagin talking about when he was a 16-year-old boy, and he had an incurable blood disease. And he, could, he was somewhat paralyzed at the time because he, could, he just couldn't, he was bedridden. And he said, he remembers people would come and see him. This one preacher came in and see him, and he said, I, I, I couldn't talk at that time. And he held my hand, and he said, oh, Lord, it'll all be over soon, and you'll be with the Lord. And he said, on the outside, I looked dead. On the inside, I was screaming, I'm not dead yet. And he said, when he left that room, it was just dark, heaviness. And I just waited there, you know, it's... But he talked about when God spoke to him and faith came into his heart. And he read the word of God and light came from the word of God and it gave him hope. I'm going to tell you, God's word gives light. God's word gives understanding. But the problem with us as Americans is we're too doggone rationally geared. We live up here all the time. Our little noodle. Our minds want to rule us. We reason. See, reasoning is of the devil. Human reasoning will blind you and it'll bind you to the circumstances you are facing. Because human reasoning, ra the rational mind says, yeah, but I tried that and I tried that and I tried that and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work. And your mind just binds yourself to that because that's what you're hearing. And somebody can tell you, no, but God's greater. Oh, yes, God's greater. And you can be saying it with your mouth and in your mind going, but God's not greater, but God's not greater, but God's not. Why, 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 why? Why is this happening if God's so great? We're like Gideon. God, if you are powerful, where are the miracles that we heard about? Where's this God you're talking about? The same place he's always been. I am the Lord. I do not change. 
God the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the same. He's the same God that caused the children of Israel to walk through the, uh, the Red Sea on dry ground. He's the same God that caused the fire to burn in the bush. He's the same God that Moses struck the rock and water came out. He's the same God that caused manna to fall out of heaven and the quails to blow into the camp. He's the same. He's the same God that the children of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stood before the mighty king and said, King, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God is for us, and our God is greater. And if we are not going to bow down to your statue, and if God wills to deliver us, so be it. But if he doesn't, we're not going to bow, period. That is faith. And they didn't have any assurance from God. They didn't have a word from God. The Lord come and say, well, don't bow down and I'll save you. They didn't even know if God would save them. They just did it by faith. We don't care because we're not compromising. And God showed up. And they're written in the Bible. Three teenagers. Wow. And God delivered them. Threw them into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks and says, did we not sit, put three men in the furnace? And there's four and the fourth one looks like the son of the gods. And they came out. And he said, come out here. And they came out. There was not even the smell of ashes upon them. And the cords that they bound them with were burnt off. Supernatural power of God. We get such a wonderful, amazing story in that that we can go right into the furnace of this world and God is well able to deliver us. Glory to God. Be careful what you're hearing. What happens? The first one that hears this word, when they don't understand it, when they don't understand who God is, when they don't have a grasp of reality, the reality of God's word, what happens? The enemy steals away the word. If you're not well versed in the truth of God's word and what God will do for you, what God said he will do for you, then it's easy for the devil to deceive you through circumstances. See, this is what I'm saying. Oftentimes, we're far too casual about the word of God and we're far too attentive to the words of man we know all about the problem we've looked at the problem inside outside upside down we've studied the problem we've analyzed the problem we've sat down and had coffee with our friends and talked about the problem we've got so much information about the problem that the problem has become a monster the problem occupies our thought life the problem occupies every conversation. The problem offer, occupies us when we lay down. It occupies us when we rise up. It occupies us when we're sitting there doing nothing. Every time our mind's not fixated on, upon something and occupying our mind, those problems come in, don't they? You just give yourself a minute. Well, I've got to keep busy because these problems, if, I, if I'm not busy, then the problems come back, right? You ever been there? Most people live their lives that way. What does the Word of God say about that? The Word of God says, I will lie down and rest, and I will arise again, for the Lord sustains me. The Word of God tells us that my mind has to be fixed on God. My mind is set on you, O Lord. See, those are the very things we're doing, which is what? Worry, fear, apprehension. What are we doing? We're meditating in our minds upon our problems, upon our circumstances. See how this works? I mean, this is, it's a very challenging thing, but this is where we're at. When our mind gets fixated upon our problems, what happens is the Word of God isn't there. So what do we have to do? We have to take God's Word and get it planted into the soil of our hearts so that the Word of God begins to grow and take precedent. So when we rise up in the morning, the Word of God speaks to us. When we go to bed at night, the Word of God speaks to us. When we're sitting at doing nothing, the Word of God rises up in us. So if circumstances come into our life, we're giving thanks unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ instead of thanks to the devil who's destroying my life. That's how faith works. Faith doesn't deny the doctor said you have cancer. Faith doesn't deny the doctor says this. Faith doesn't not deny you look at your checkbook or your bank account and there's no money in there. Faith doesn't deny that you have a need. Faith simply says, I know that I have a need, but God is greater than the need. God is well able. And so, Father, I don't care what the need says. I care that you are well able. Because guess what happens? When we trust God, when we put our cold confidence in God, and we completely rely upon him, God has an opportunity to show himself strong in our behalf. 
Oftentimes, we, we never let God do that. I mean, I'm as guilty as the next person. That at times, I try to take and make things change and make them happen myself and work things out instead of saying, God, I completely rely on you in this situation. God, I humble myself before you. Lord, I'm just putting myself in a position that you're going to have to come through. And when you do, which I know you always have, I'm going to give you all the glory, all of it. I'm going to stand up before people and I'm going to say, look what the Lord has done. And if he did it in my life, he can do it in your life. Don't you love to hear testimonies of what God has done in people's lives? Doesn't it encourage you when you hear of testimonies of how God has changed and set people free? I mean, think of Bruce Veneta when he was here last year. Probably have Bruce in again this year, Lord willing. Remember the guy, big Peterbilt semi fell on him and squished him that thick. All of his intestines, except about that much, were taken out. Sitting in a hospital, a man speaks, God speaks to a man in New York City that had heard about Bruce Veneta, tells him to go buy an airplane ticket, fly to Madison, Wisconsin, and pray for him to heal him. This man wasn't a preacher. He was a construction worker or something like that. Business owner. Took his own money, about 700 bucks, bought himself an airplane ticket, flew out there, laid hands on Bruce Veneta's head, and Bruce said when he laid his hands upon me, it was like hitting an electric fence. I heard this pop, and he said, all of a sudden, he said to my, I said to my friend, it felt like a snake uncoiled in my belly. God supernaturally grew back all of his intestines. Totally. A miracle. A reconstructive, creative miracle. That's a miracle. That's something that wasn't there, and God put it there. Total heal. Doesn't that encourage you? My Lord, if God can do that for him, he can certainly do it for me. But you know, you hear that part of the story, right? That's one part of that story. You don't hear the story that Bruce went through numerous operations. Bruce was dying. Bruce went through all this stuff, and nothing was happening as far as healing goes on, right? He was wasting away to nothing. Well, was God just as real then as he was when the miracle took place? People were praying. People were believing God. But when the miracle took place, it took place by the power of God, and I believe it was at the hands of God's people praying for God to do something. Glory to God, because he had a lot of people praying and believing and standing in faith for him to be totally healed. Well, isn't that a good testimony? Isn't that an amazing thing the Lord has done? And because of his healing, because of God healing that one man, thousands upon thousands of people have been healed and touched around the world because of the testimony of what God did in my life. Because, see, when you hear what God can do in somebody else's life, you go, man, if God could do that in your life, my need isn't even half that big. You certainly could get me a job. You certainly could... Give me some money to pay my bills. You certainly could heal my body because this isn't even a quarter of what you're dealing with. Right? Isn't that amazing? See, that's why the Bible is full of stories of what God has done in people's lives because when we read these stories, we go, wow, God, I'm not facing giants. I'm not facing circumstances that are anywhere near as big as this, and you were able to do it in their lives, and you're not a respecter of persons. You're a respecter of faith, and I'm a man of God, a woman of God. I'm a person of God. Should not this man or this woman be in a daughter, a child of Abraham, be loosed from this infirmity on the Sabbath? I mean, if you did this... 2,000 years ago, you laid hands on the sick and they recovered. Why can't you do it today? You're the same God. Amen. The first person, they received the seed by the wayside and they did not understand it. Why didn't they understand it? Well, there's a lot of reasons people don't understand. And one of the reasons people don't understand how God works is because they're so steeped in hearing what God doesn't do. They're so steeped in hearing how that God is not able. They're so steeped in unbelief. I mean, there's whole camps of people today that try to convince us that the miracles and the power and the real, the real supernatural power of God that we read about in the Bible, in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, is all gone that that was only for a select few at a certain period of time, and now that's been passed away because now we just read the Word of God and we believe God. To me, that's like 
having gasoline and no match. You tell me God wrote all these stories of people being healed and people being set free and miracles and power so that we can't do any of that or have any of that? Really? I mean, it all passed away at the first apostle, last apostle, that that's all gone now. Now we simply walk by faith and not by sight. We understand that. But all these miracles that Jesus did and all the miracles we read about in the Old Covenant, and although they didn't happen every single day, but there's spectacular miracles in here. There's miracles and accounts of healing. John himself, the Apostle John said, had Jesus, had we recorded all the things that Jesus himself did, I suppose the very books of the world couldn't contain them all. You're telling me that God who did these wonderful, amazing things through his son, Jesus Christ, is telling us that was all for just him and the apostles, and it's all gone today. So don't get your hopes up. Really? For real? Come on. I don't buy it. I believe that the word says the God that we look at in the Bible that was able to change circumstances, able to shut the mouth of lions, able to overcome death, able to overcome the sword, able to overcome fire, I believe he's the same God. I believe he's well able. And not only able, I believe he's willing. But what's, what makes God willing? Well, he's willing because he's God. And he's willing because he said he was willing. And he's willing because he cares about you. He loves you with an unquenchable love, a, a burning desire. He loves you so uh, just consumingly. He just loves you. And he loves you because he watches over his word to perform it. The eyes of the Lord run true and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts are upright before him. So this morning, I've been preaching to you messages about the power of God and what God can do. Now, this is the deal. See, when you hear about what God can do, what God has done, and what God will do, what happens? Faith, confidence, assurance in God comes. Now, if you have a problem in your life, no matter what that problem is, and it's been hanging around, the first and foremost thing you're going to have to do is get you a big bottle of Gospels. And you're going to have to vigilantly take those Gospels when you rise up, when you sit down to eat, and when you go to bed. You're going to have to feed yourself on the Gospels of Jesus Christ. And you're going to have to do it and do it and do it. Because if you go back to Dr. Jesus and he's been giving you Gospels and you say, Dr. Jesus, I'm sorry, I only took one of your Gospels and then I sat down and watched the nightly news the rest of the time. Is it any wonder that the Gospel is not working in your life? See, this is the part <laughs> that we don't like to hear. But they taste terrible. But it takes me so long to eat those. They're so big. But it's inconvenient. But I've got other things to do. See, God doesn't work on our timetable. You look in the Bible, for instance. You look at people who received from Jesus in his earthly ministry. There were those who Jesus would preach the gospel to, and he would sometimes just feel the prompting of the Lord to go over and heal somebody when they didn't ask him. I think about the widow's son who had died. And Jesus is walking down the street one day, and he sees a funeral procession, and he looks, and it's this teenage boy who had died, and his mother is there, his widow, his, his mother, and she's a widow. Well, think of the implication of what Jesus did and the compassion of what Jesus did because he stops, he goes over and raises this boy from the dead. There's much more to that story than simply him being compassionate and raising a young man from the dead. He raised her meal ticket from the dead because this woman would have been destined for poverty and a beggar because your welfare back then wasn't the government, it was your family. And if you were a widow, you were at the bottom of the totem pole. And... She, he saved her life. 
God prompted him to raise this boy up to save this woman to, to make sure she had an income in the future and a hope in the future because then he'd have children and those children would perpetuate the seed and those children were responsible so it was his responsibility to take care of his mother right that was his welfare but you find times where Jesus is walking down the street as well and he wasn't looking for people to go heal well who should we go heal today guys Who's on my list? And what would happen? People would just interrupt him. The woman with the issue of blood. Jairus. The blind man. Right? Matter of fact, we looked at that last week. Jairus, whose daughter is dying, he comes to Jesus and begs him, Lord, Lord, come and heal my daughter, for she's at the point of death and if you'll come and lay your hands on her, she'll live. And Jesus begins to come with him to go heal his daughter and the woman with the issue of blood, who when she heard of Jesus, said in herself, when she heard of Jesus, what is it she heard about? She heard that the Messiah has come. She's a Jew. The Messiah has come. And he's healing people. This has to be the Messiah because no prophet has ever done the miracles this man. I mean, he's raising dead people. He's opening blind eyes. I mean, I was there and I saw him. This has to be the Messiah. And you know what this woman does? She says in herself, the Messiah, the real Messiah. Because what does the word say about the Messiah? She knew the word. See, this is why you got to know the word. The word said this, that the Messiah would rise with healing in his tzitzi, his ceremonial prayer shawl, his wings. The Messiah would rise. And she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, literally the tzitzi, the prayer shawl, tassel on a rabbi's prayer shawl, if I may but just touch one of those threads, which by the way, one of them were blue, which is the color of healing. If I could just touch it. I will be made whole. She had an issue of blood for 12, 12 years this went on. 12 years, she'd gone to every doctor, she'd gone to the Mayo Clinic, she'd gone to the specialist, she'd gone to every person she could go to, and she could not get any better. Instead, she continued to get worse and worse and worse, and she spent all of her money, and she was about to the point of dying. She was about to the point of giving up all hope, but she heard, she heard, she heard, and faith came. Faith comes by hearing. Glory to God. She heard and she said. She heard and she said. She heard and she said. Because faith comes by hearing and faith is released by saying. We believe in our heart and we say with our mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. Jesus, you are my healer. Jesus, you are my banker. Jesus, you are my supplier. Jesus, you are my deliverer. Jesus, you are my provider. She believed the word, she believed the report, and she said in herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And she came out in public, which was forbidden in the Torah, because mercy has triumphed over judgment. Law came by Moses, mercy came for Christ. Mercy triumphs law, always. Law gives you judgment, mercy gives you mercy. And she comes out in public, and she touches a rabbi, which was the death penalty. You cannot contaminate someone because if you had a flow of blood, a woman when she was in her menstrual cycle could not touch anybody. She couldn't even be public. If you touched somebody with a flow of blood, you were unclean. And she finds him. She pushes through the crowd. I can't imagine this woman. I mean, throngs of people are pressing. Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus. Throngs of people are pressing. She presses through the crowd, probably crawled through the crowd, gets up there and touches his garment, and power comes out of Jesus and goes into her body and heals her. And because it says she felt in herself that she was healed of this infirmity. And Jesus stops because he, incent he felt the power, and he says, somebody touch me. Somebody has touched me. And they said, Messiah, Master, there's all kinds of people touching you. And he said, no, I felt power go out of me. Somebody touched me. What's the difference? Everybody else wants something from Jesus, don't they? Why are they around him? I mean, he's a celebrity. People are thronging him. They want something from him. They want... Jesus, I want something from you. I want to see a miracle from you. I want my bank account filled. I want, I want something. People come after people when he can, they can give them something. 
And we know that the crowds followed Jesus because when he fed the 5,000, the next day a whole group of them came and said, this guy's a meal ticket, man. He's better than the U.S. government. And, uh, he, they, <laughs> and uh, so he, they were thronging him. And Jesus himself said, you didn't come because of who I am. You came because, you know, you got a full belly and expect me to feed you, but I'm not going to do that. And what happens? He stops and he said, somebody touch me. And the woman trembling fell down below him and told him everything that had happened. And she was made whole of her plague. And Jesus said, daughter, be of good cheer, your, your, your faith has made you whole. Your trust, your confidence, your assurance in my ability, the power of God has done this thing in your life. Wow, what, a to- what an amazing story in that. Aren't you glad that woman is in the Bible? Wow. Because that's such a powerful illustration of how we can just sit at home and pout and do nothing and the power of God will walk right by our house. And that is exactly the problem I have with the providential view of God that we just sit around and God, if he wants us to happen, he'll just show up at our house. I don't see that in the Bible. Faith without works, faith without corresponding action, faith that does nothing is nothing. It's worthless. If we say we believe God, then by faith we act like we believe God. That means when we get up in the morning, we thank you, Lord, that you have heard my prayers. Lord, when I go to bed at night, I thank you, Lord, that the answer is here. Lord, it's so good to be healed. Lord, it's so good to be free. But you don't look healed, and you don't look feel, uh, free, and you don't look uh, like God's done anything. Yeah, but I don't walk by, fa- by sight. I walk by faith. I don't walk by what I see. I walk by what God said. I don't walk by what the doctor says. I don't walk by what my bank account says. I don't walk by what my circumstances say because even though there may be giants in the land, my God is well able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can even ask or think. There were giants in the land, in the nation, of, in the land of Canaan. But God didn't say, hey, when you get there, make sure you look out for the giants. Do you think God spent 40 years? Oh, by the way, Abraham, see this land? Lift up your eyes and look. As far as your eyes can see, I'm going to give this land to you and your descendants forever. Look up at the stars, Abraham. Look at how many. Count them. One, two. You can't count them, can you? That's the way your descendants are going to be. They're going to be so many descendants. They're going to be like the stars of the heaven. Abraham, hey, look at the sand. Pick up some sand and start counting the pebbles. I can't do that, Lord. That's the way your descendants are going to be. God is an exaggerator. God doesn't say, take two or three, and that's how they're going to be. He's given Abraham a picture of what his future is going to be like. Listen, Abraham, I'm a God of abundance. I'm a God that always gives you better than you deserve. I'm a God who causes things to happen in people's lives because I love just doing things and bragging on myself. So God tells us to Abraham, even though Abraham doesn't even have a son. Isn't that cool? God always tells you stuff that by human standards won't happen, it can't happen. And listen, we're no different. God is telling you things today. God has put visions in your heart. God has put plans in your life that are impossible to do. And everybody's telling you they're impossible to do. And your mind is, this can't happen. How could this ever happen? I'm just me. And I just live here. And I'm blah, 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 blah. That's the way it is. Right? But God says, I know all about that. I know where you live. I know what you do. I know your bank account. I know everything. I know you better than you know my, yourself. I can count every hair on your head. I could tell you the name of every cell in your body. I know your thoughts when you rise up and when you lie down. I know everything. There's nothing before me that's hidden. You think you're hiding. You're not hiding one thing from me. I know everything about you. More than you'll ever know. But I love you anyhow. <laughs> and glory to Jesus. Go back to our originally scheduled story here. Jesus walking down the road, the woman gets healed, power goes out of Jesus when he wasn't even looking to do anything. That shows us something. It takes faith to move the hand of God into your life. You have to do something. 
you have to step out and accept and call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, you know I have need, and I'm calling upon you, and I'm expecting you to do this because you're God, and I am nothing but your servant and your child, but I am well able and well believing that you're well able to do this in my life. Amen. And then what happens? Jairus, this big commotion is going on. And I don't know how long this took place, but it might have gone on for quite a while where this whole story is playing out. And you can imagine the ripple that goes through the crowd of this woman. She got healed. This woman had this blah, blah, blah. And this big commotion is going through the crowd of this miracle that took place in this woman's life. And Jairus is standing in the background. Can you just see Jairus? He's by this time kind of pushed to the back. He's somewhere around Jesus because he's obviously within earshot. But he's not the focal point now, is he? And somebody comes from his house. There's always the bearer of bad news. Delay. See, things in our lives get delayed. It seems like God was doing this, but what happened? I'm right at the brink. I, I mean, so many times I've looked at people or they've been at situations that I'm believing God and everything's going great and everything's going great and everything's going great and then all of a sudden it just like things turn completely around and go south. Everything's falling apart. It's all falling apart right before my eyes. And what does the word of God say? What does the living, breathing, eternal, life-changing word of God say? He turns around because they come to Jairus and they say, why bother the master further? Why bother believing for your needs to be met? Why bother believing for victory? The end has come and you've been defeated. Right? And they come and they say, Jairus, don't bother the master any further. Sorry, your daughter's dead. Can you imagine Jairus at that moment? Just fear. Fear. And Jesus hears the word of God, because he's the living word of God, right? The living word of God hears the report. What's changed today? This living word of God still hears the report. Jesus, the son, the living God, living word of God in heaven, who gives, bears witness of the written word of God, he still hears. So you have a circumstance in your life just like Jairus. You have a dream in your heart. You have a belief system. You are believing for something. And the report comes that it's dead. The dream is dead. The hope is dead. The, the answer is dead. You're not going to get the answer. Your hope is gone. And the word of God hears the report. And immediately the word of God turns around and says, Do not be afraid. Only believe. Don't let that report enter into your heart. Do not let fear come upon you. Resist it. Don't, be, don't believe the report of man. Don't re believe the report of the enemy. But it's a report. I mean, she's dead. Was she really dead? Absolutely. She's dead as a doornail. Right? She's dead. You've lost. Game over. Thanks for playing. You could put any number of scenarios that we face on a daily basis or in our lives in that equation, right? But what's the key? We're talking about overcoming fear. We're talking about overcoming the enemy. What's the key? This is such a vital key. I mean, it is paramount. You get this. The very first report and how you react to the very first report will often determine whether you end up with the victory or the defeat. I mean, I'm telling this, the first report you hear and how you react to the first report you hear is oftentimes whether you end up with the victory or the defeat. And Jesus gives us a living illustration of that. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would do what he already has done. When that bill comes into your house and you open your mail and in big bold letters, here's a big bill that you didn't expect to get and it's gazillions of dollars more than you anticipated to have and you don't have that money and how am I going to pay this? That should not be the first thing that comes out of our mouth. 
because what is going to happen? We all get slammed with things we're not anticipating. My car blew up, my motors. You said my transmission is going to be how much money? Wasn't planning on that. You said what doctor? Wasn't planning on that. What's the report? So what do we have choice? Do not be afraid. Because the temptation and the real catch is we want to start letting our mouth flap. Well, what did you do? Or we'll tack, how, how did you let this happen? We want to blame somebody. This is outrageous, right? Why did you do this? You know, husbands and wife, the number one thing they fight over is money. Number one cause of strife in marriage is finances and stress from lack of finances. Well, is that going to change your marriage? Yeah, make it go down the drain. Are you going to change circumstance because you bought, blame your wife because she bought a dress or pantyhose or something? You know, you're going to... That's not going to help, right? So what do we have to do? Here's the report. We have to do what Jesus said. Do not fear, only believe. Well, I don't know how we're going to pay this, but God does. I don't know where the money's going to come from, but God does. I don't know any of the answers, but Father God, I know you do. So my hope is in you. I don't care what I see. I don't care what this says. I'm just going to put my confidence in you. And Lord, I lay myself and lay this at your mercy that you're going to have to come through. And I'm not going to spend one morning, not one moment. And you might want to say this to the devil. Let, devil, I just want to serve you notice. Don't mess with me. Don't bug me and don't harass me with trying to put fear on me. Because you know what I'm going to do to you, devil? If you do that, I'm going to go to my bank account and I'm going to take the money I do have in there, which may not be a lot, and I'm going to empty it out and give it to somebody. You mess with me, I'll give away everything. You really want us to do that? Call his bluff. Call his bluff. Now, that's up to you. I'm not saying, well, Pastor Tim said go give away everything, and now I'm living in a pup tent, and I'm blaming him because, you know, that's one of those faith preachers again. See, they're not trustworthy. They always tell you to do a stupid thing, and I go out and do it, and it's, I'm broke, you know. That's what God tells you to do. You can't operate on what, well, so-and-so did this, and he had a money and for a house, and God told him to go give away it, and God gave him a new house. God told him. He didn't tell you. Right? You better know God's telling you to do this stuff. Well, I'm just doing what he did. That's like the Jesus that Paul preaches. Doesn't work. God has to speak it to you. You have to know that you know that you know that God spoke to you. And there's times my wife and I have done things in faith where we didn't have any money or we didn't have the money and God spoke to us to give money that we didn't have. And you know, without exception, every single time when God has spoken to us, we've always got it back and more besides. Every single time. Every time. You know, I think of my family and the faithfulness of God. You know, Ann said to me the other day, we were something about some financial issue we were dealing with at the time. And she said, I don't remember what she said to me, but I said, you know, think about it. We have never gone without since we've been believers, ever. Ever. Now, there's been times in our life where things have been very tight financially. But God has always taken care of us. I have never been to the point in my life financially since since we started walking in the word of truth, the word of faith, we have never been at a point in our lives by the grace of God where we have not been able to pay our bills. We have never been at a point in our lives where the, we, we have had to wonder where our next meal is coming from. We have never been at a point in our lives where God has not taken care of us. Now, you may be at a point in your life right now and say, well, I wish that was me. I'm going to tell you, it has nothing to do with me because I'm not a financial genius by any means. If I took a financial class, I would fail at it. But this one thing I know, I believe that God is faithful. And I tell you, there have been so many things that have not come my, nigh my dwelling. That doesn't mean we've never had trouble. And it doesn't mean that we've never faced situations where we needed more money. But we have never been without. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging for bread, ever. God has always taken care of us. And he will always take care of us. And I like the eagle song. 
If it all fell to pieces tomorrow, would you still be the Lord's? If you made that into a Christian song. What if everything fell apart tomorrow? What if it fell apart? Where would your faith be? Would you be down at the bar drinking and smoking stuff and, you know, crying out, and, oh, I don't know why the Lord forsaken me? Or would you be giving glory to God? Our hope is not in this world, folks. Our hope is in God. We must, we must put our confidence in God. But I'm going to tell you, just like Brother Steve said, God is well able to do more than you can ever think. But you have to believe he's well able. You have to start hearing that he's well able. You have to change your thinking to change your believing. We're going to get into this when we talk about faith, when we get into our series on faith. Your faith will only rise to the degree of your vision. Now, I'm going to challenge you. I'm telling you the truth. One of the challenges of living here, one of the challenges of living in northern Wisconsin, because I've lived here most of my life, is it will dwarf your vision and dwarf your dreams if you're not careful. It's the fishbowl scenario. You put, a gup, you put a goldfish in a fishbowl, that goldfish will grow to the size of the bowl. Do you know that if a, a goldfish is somewhat of a form of a carp? If you take a goldfish and put it in a river, it will grow huge. I've seen goldfish in ponds, big ponds. They're that long. They're like a red horse. They're big. Why do they not grow? Because they're surrounded by an environment that keeps them small. Are you surrounded by an environment that keeps you dwarfed in your dreaming, dwarfed in your believing? So your dreams will affect your believing. If you live by northern Wisconsin standard, listen, I live in the poorest county in, in Wisconsin. Russ County is the poorest county in Russ County in, in Wisconsin. It always has been for years and years. And you know what? There is a mentality in the Northwoods that you see with people, and it's if I just got enough to pay my bills and put food on the table, I'm happy. Listen, that's not the best God has for you. And if we continue to let where we live and the environment we live in and the finance, well, there's no jobs and there's no money, and you, we just keep saying that and saying that and saying that. I don't care if there's no jobs or no money. I'm going to tell you, God can bring somebody from across the world to prosper you if you need to. I was just talking to somebody the other day about this very thing because my heart is to go to the world. And there have been times since I've been at this church that the devil has convinced me that that's never going to happen. I have lost sight of my vision because I believe that one day I'm going to go to the nations. I'm going to be able to go to Africa, be able to go to these nations because people call you and they want you to come. I want to go to Africa and raise up Bible schools. I want to raise up Living Faith Church Africa. I want to bless people around the world. I, if my desire would be that we would put a pastor in here, one of you would stand here and you would you would pastor and I would travel to the nations for a month at a time and come back and we'd have a, more than we've got going on right now, I'll tell you that. Because the nations is, are crying out for the gospel. That's my heart. And there have been times where the enemy has bombarded my mind and said you'll never be able to do that because I don't have the money to do it in my own ability. This church where we're at right now financially can't do that. We're just in the natural. And there have been times in my life the devil has said, you know what, you're going to waste your time. It's never going to happen. This big dream that you're dreaming of, revival in Wisconsin and going to the nations, who are you? And that's never going to happen. And I believe that at times. And I've become discouraged. But I'm going to tell you, I was just talking to somebody the other day about this very thing, and they were asking me, what's your vision? And I started sharing my vision with them and said, you know what, you have the vision, I'll get the money. See, God doesn't give you vision so you can just become frustrated with it. God doesn't put things in your heart so that you can't fulfill them. God doesn't give you desires so that you can just sit around and go, oh, I'd sure like to do that, but that's never going to happen. Thanks a lot, God. He doesn't do that. God puts vision in your heart, and he tests your heart where you're at and how faithful you are with what you have, and everything has seasons, and God puts things in your heart, and he wants to change you but when the time come when the fullness of the promise had come when the fullness of time had come that the promise be fulfilled when the time comes for God to fulfill the vision for your life as long as you don't cast away your confidence in the Lord God will move heaven and hell to get the answer to you he'll move it so I don't care where you live I don't care what job you have 
God is not limited by our jobs. He's not limited by the town we live in. He's not limited by anything except our lack of belief. Because we dwarf our dreams, because the around where we live, well, there's no money around here. Everybody's broke. There's no money. There's no money. There's no money. There's no money. Turn your television on. Look at Hollywood. Look at stuff that's going on. And you tell me, there's no money. The White House just had a dinner that cost $150,000 at taxpayers' money. Our government wastes more money in probably five seconds, well, it'd be less than five, than all the people in northern Wisconsin, Russ Sawyer and Barron and Washburn County spend in their lifetime. There is not a lack of money. Approximately something along the line of $5 trillion circles the globe every day. There is plenty of money. There's lots of money. But it's in the hands of the wrong people. Or it's in circulation because you just need to get your faith out there and pull some of that money into your life. There's not a lack of money. What would you think would happen to Russ County or Sawyer County or Washburn County or Barron County if some major development came in here overnight? I was just talking. Here's, here's an example. I've got to wrap it up with this. I have a friend uh, who pastors a church in Menominee, Pastor Paul uh, Carlson. I was just talking to him on the phone the other day, and they just built a new building. Or didn't build a building. They were going to build a building. They bought some land for a building. And, you know, he's talking to me about starting a building project in my mind, my carnal, unbelieving mind, when he said that to me, my mind kicked in and go, boy, this is probably not a good time to be building a building right now. You know, that's what I was thinking. I didn't say that to him, thank the Lord. Because, you know, you shouldn't say everything you think. Things come into your mind that aren't God. And my mind goes, man, I, well, I prayed with him. Let me believe God. Oh, thanks for praying, you unbeliever. But <laughs> so... Um, but he was telling me about this, and it came into my mind, like, well, this is probably a really bad time to start a building project. But I'm going to tell you, see, this is what happens when you listen to the wind and watch the, watch the wind and listen to the report of man. Because the economy is, you know, economy is not doing well, this is not doing well, that's not doing well, blah, blah, blah. Well, he lives in Menominee, and he told me the other day they bought this building downtown, and they renovated it. They were able, they had banks fighting over them. They were able to renovate the whole building, gut the whole building, rebuild the whole building with cash in their pockets, debt-free. Not only that, the land that they had bought to build this building on, because in Menominee, everybody's moving there from the Twin Cities. When they bought it, it's worth about 10 times more. It's prime real estate. And it's only going to go up because there's like somewhere in the vicinity of 5 million homes or something like that. I don't know. There's an astronomical number of homes they're having to build over in the Sawyer, uh, the St. Croix Falls area, the whole border area, because everybody from the cities is moving out of the cities to Wisconsin. What? How, I don't think God could do anything like that. I'm going to tell you, God does some amazing things. But he doesn't do them in the way we think he does them. And God will change your life, but he generally never, I mean, not generally, he never works in the way we think it should happen. He always works in mysterious ways, and I'm way over my time. So the Lord is good and greatly to be praised. Why don't we stand to our feet and shout about it this morning a little bit. Hallelujah. Glory to God.